Welcome to the Law School Toolbox Podcast. Today we're talking about how to survive the notorious Socratic method. Your Law School Toolbox hosts are Allison Monaghan and Lee Burgess. That's me. We're here to demystify the law school and early legal career experience so you'll be the best law student and lawyer you can be. We're the co-creators of the Law School Toolbox, the Bar Exam Toolbox, and the Catapult Conference. Allison also runs the Girl's Guide to Law School. If you enjoy the show, please leave a review on iTunes. And if you have any questions, don't hesitate to reach out to us. You can reach us via the contact form on lawschooltoolbox.com, and we'd love to hear from you. And with that, let's get started. Welcome back to the Law School Toolbox podcast. Today, we're talking about something everyone lives through in law school, the dreaded Socratic method. So, Lee, first off, what is the Socratic method? Well, in its purest form, the Socratic method involves the professor randomly selecting some unlikely student to be what everyone calls on call that day. And then without warning, you can find yourself on the spot being grilled about the fine details of whatever case you read several days before. And um, you may not actually have fully understood the case to begin with, but that doesn't really matter. Your professor is still going to ask you questions. Um, And this is really the typical Socratic method. Um, If you're in law school, you might notice that not all professors conduct class in this way. Now, there are a lot of more enlightened professors that try and tone things down, either by having assigned panels or students that know they're on call for a specific day. Uh, But they're still going to put you on the spot when it comes right down to it. You're going to have to speak in front of your entire 1L class. Yeah, absolutely. And I think for a lot of people, this can be really intimidating, particularly the idea that you don't necessarily, well, you don't actually typically get to choose when you want to talk. So mm-hmm. it's not like in a previous education where maybe if you raised your hand and it had something interesting to say, the professor might call on you and you could say it here. You might just get randomly plucked and Miss Burgess, could you please recite the facts of the case? And hopefully at that point you are paying attention. Right. <laughs> and <laughs> you hear your name being called and you're not, it's not the situation which sometimes happens where they're like, Miss Burgess? Is, is Miss Burgess here today? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And you're like kind of hiding behind your laptop and you don't really hear your name or you're chatting with someone online or. <laughs> yeah. And a lot of, you know, a lot of professors have assigned seating for this reason so they can look up and see if you're actually there before they call on you. Mm-hmm. But some classes, it'll just be, you know, you can sit wherever you want. And in theory, at least, you could try to hide. <laughs> <laughs> you can try. Eventually, they'll probably find you, though. Yeah. I mean, you know, because this is an important part of your class participation, professors are typically checking off sort of who they've called on. I mean, most of them have a system. The system might be identifiable to you or recognizable. It might not be. You know, I had, I think my torch professor just went down the row. So you could pretty easily say, okay, well, you know, two days from today or three days from today, I'm pretty likely to be on call. Mm -hmm. But, you know, some of them go randomly. Some of them... I mean, who knows? There are probably as many systems as there are professors. Probably. with, And I remember seeing some professors' seating charts where they had all sorts of weird little marks all yeah, over they all, it. Yeah, it's like crazy. If you ever see one, they've got like all these, and you're like, what are they? I think a lot of times they're just marking like who have they called on, who have they, you know, who's volunteered. Mm-hmm. Because at some point, if the same people are constantly volunteering, you know, it's not great practice to keep calling on those people. Yep. You know, we had someone in my first year torch class, we just referred to as the hand because literally every single time a question was asked and then lots of times that no questions had been asked, his hand went up. Yeah, that's pretty And, you know, by like week three, the professor's, you know, his hand is the only one up and the professor is sort of like, all right, would anyone else like to say anything today? Mm -hmm. That's really funny. And some professors really like the old school method of calling everyone by their last names, where some of the new professors, you know, kind of put that to the side and call people by their first names. I always thought it was funny how in my 1L section, there were a ton of people I didn't know, but I knew what everybody's last names were, but I didn't oh, know I, yeah. anyone's still, first name. Oh, yeah. Like, if I look on Facebook and somebody's like, gotten married and changed their last name, I have no idea who they are anymore. <laughs> I, I never, like, I just never knew their first name. Yeah. You know? <laughs> I mean... <laughs> I find that, I mean, coming from California, that was pretty weird. Mm -hmm. Um, But yeah, you know, it's a much more formal sort of experience. And I think some professors do like that feeling of, I'm just going to point to someone and they're on call. I mean, I think the theory is it keeps people on their toes. It makes them do the reading. Um, Is it worth it in terms of like fear for the entire class, plus the fact that you're probably not getting the necessarily the best responses from someone who's just been plucked from the list. Mm -hmm. But 
I think you, I mean, most people probably will still encounter these kind of pure Socratic method, old school professors. Yeah, I think that's true. Even though it's been something that's been around for a long time, it's probably good to note that not all professors are particularly good at running class in this way. It's actually quite hard. It's really hard. And I think if nothing else, one thing to take away is to have some pity on your poor professor who's standing up there in front of the class trying to extract useful information from students who may or may not have actually done the reading or may may or may not be prepared for class. And, you know, if you're a professor, you have a goal for what you want people to take away from this particular class or you wouldn't be there. Mm -hmm. And if you're not getting very good material to work with, it could be really hard. Yeah. If you've never taught at all, there's nothing like the silence. Oh, that, God. That you almost, you almost like feel, You almost understand why they just point to someone. Yeah. Because, I mean, and I haven't taught a Socratic method class, but when I would teach, and I wasn't even teaching large lecture halls, but when you ask for some sort of a volunteer or some sort of engagement to a sea of people and they just stare back at you, it is just Yeah, like just no one misery. raises their hand, no one says anything, no one does anything. Right. And then, you know, there's usually like the couple of people who are take pity on you and like raise their hand and give you the answer. But you're just like, God, you know, what is going on with all these other people? Like, are they like, what? Are they not paying attention? Do (laughs) they not understand? Like, do they hate me? Like, what's happening? It is is very miserable. Um, So, you know, I think if a professor is doing a poor job at it, you also have to ask if maybe they're just don't have a class that's particularly engaged. But um, I think you have to just work with whatever skills your professor has in this area. Yeah, I mean, there's someone who... Someone who's really, you know, really practiced and really talented at this and knows what they're trying to do, like they can do more with one page of material than most professors in law school can do with like the entire book. Yeah. But it's a gift to be able to do this. And it's a skill. Yeah. Um, And, you know, professors are better and worse at it. So, I mean, given this, why don't they just sort of go in and tell you what the law is? Why don't they just give a lecture? Well, that would be easier. But <laughs> that is definitely not the way that it's done. I had one first year professor in like a legal theory class who did that and it was so great. I'm sure. Well, I think it's more and more common. Some professors are at least using PowerPoints or things like that to try and spoon feed the law a little bit more. Yeah. But I think that there is this idea that the Socratic method does have its value when it is used well. And part of that is, is because one of the skills that you are going to need to learn as a lawyer is one, how to read and think about cases. Um, Um, to how to speak about what you've read and thought about, because that's something that you need to do in your job as well. But you also need to get comfortable um, doing legal analysis. And one of the things that happens as part of the Socratic method is you're usually given hypos or exercises that you have to think through um, with the professor. And that is exactly the skill set that you will be using on your exams. Right. And I think it's also good because ideally it shows people that there's not We're not just looking for like one definitive answer here. Mm -hmm. And that can be a subtle point because you are looking to extract, as we'll talk about later, to actually extract the rules of law from this discussion. Mm -hmm. However, part of the point is to show you like where these gray areas are, where the ambiguity is. So, you know, say you read a case and it's like, oh, you know, it came out this way. This is the black letter law. And then your professor starts saying, well, you know, what if instead of being green, the light had been yellow? oh, well, what if instead of the car doing this, it had done that? What if instead of the person being on the sidewalk, they had been in the crosswalk? And you might find this infuriating. (laughs) Yeah, I mean, lots of people are just like, I cannot believe we are wasting time going through like every possible scenario of what might happen. Can't we just talk about what did happen? Mm -hmm. But the point is, all these other things might happen in real life. And your job, if you're an attorney, might be to, you know, be on one side or the other of that case where someone did walk out in the crosswalk looking at their cell phone and got hit by a car. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you've got to apply that previous law that maybe there's not a case on that, but you can analogize from these other cases. And so one of the things that you have to focus on is kind of dealing with all of these different situations in something like your class notes. And I think it's important to remember that you're not just looking for the black letter law in those cases. Oftentimes you're going to see different professors really be interested in different things that come out of the cases. You know, some professors might be really into the way the appellate courts create you know, their opinions, you know, what are the kind of themes of what they think is important in this certain class of cases? That's probably important to note. I bet you're going to see some question about that on your exam. Or um, some professors are really into 
you know, the different parties' arguments. They care less about the outcome of what the court decided, but more about, you know, what the government would argue and what a defendant would argue. Or some professors are obsessed with policy, and so they want to really spend time making sure that you appreciate the policy discussion. You know, your case book's not going to tell you what the policy discussion is. They just give you the case. You have to typically. read it and think about it, <laughs> typically. And so, you know, it's also a really good exercise about being able to... Um, go through this case law and find the things that the professor thinks is important because in in your career you're going to have to go through a case law and pull things out that you think are important to make your arguments right or that you think the judge thinks is important right which is probably even more important <laughs> <laughs> if we're talking about the importance of importance yeah um right i mean no i think that's absolutely right that class is really where these sort of generic case books kind of come to life Mm -hmm. yeah and it's actually interesting if you turn off your internet and pay attention and follow what's going on in class you might be surprised at what you actually learn i think what can be really frustrating about the socratic method is if you are not paying attention it can be completely infuriating because it's very hard to come in and out of a focus yeah i think you really have to try to focus otherwise it's just not going to (laughs) happen Yeah, but we hear over and over again from students that they are petrified of class discussion, of, of getting called on in class, of looking stupid in class. So Allison, what do, what do you say to someone who is just maybe starting law school right now and thinks they are just like their palms are sweating every time they sit down? <laughs> They're to- doomed if they get called on. Yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, I think the inevitability is there will be a time in law school where you get called on and you say something that is not exactly correct. Right. That's just kind of the way it goes. Um, I would probably say, hazard a guess, almost every lawyer who has made it through law school has a story about the time, particularly first year, when they got called on or even in some cases volunteered and just said something that was like so not on point that, you know, the professor just gets this look of like, huh, should I just move on? Should I correct this person? (laughs) Like, what do I do here? You can kind of see them thinking and then usually they call on somebody else. Yeah. Um, you know, and that could feel devastating at the time. Like, I know I have a story like that. You have a story like that. I mean, ironically, in both of those cases, we end up TAing the class. So you know, I think the takeaway here is this is a learning experience. And no one else is paying nearly as much attention to you as you are. And so I could not tell you one example of someone else in my class getting called on and saying something stupid. Nope, not one. But you better believe I remember all the times I did it. (laughs) Exactly, exactly. And this is kind of goes back to that theme that we talked about um, way in the early episodes of our podcast about this growth mindset and that you have to go into these experiences knowing that you're pushing yourself. This is an opportunity to stretch and grow. And if you screw up, it does not mean that you're stupid or shouldn't be in law school. It just means that you didn't know the answer that day. And maybe you can even think about how you could have known the answer. Maybe it's that you didn't brief the cases before class or that you didn't have time to do your reading or you were, you know, shopping for shoes online instead of paying attention, whatever might happen, you can or still it might evaluate be, it. It might be that you have some fundamental misunderstanding about what the law is. Yeah. And that's a good thing to get cleared up now before the exam. Exactly. I mean, class is the place where you want to make mistakes. And so you just want to keep that in mind and remember that it's not like this professor is not going to give you a letter of recommendation because you answered the question wrong in his class. No, I mean, they deal with this every day yeah. in every, like I would, you know, if you're a professor teaching like, you know, say two class, two lectures a day, I would say every day someone's going to say something you're just like, God, where did they get that? Mm-hmm. And then the professor starts thinking, am I doing a terrible job teaching? Right. Like, did they not understand what I'm saying? Like, where did they get that? Yeah. And then they sit in their office thinking they're a terrible professor <laughs> because you don't understand what they're talking about. Right. <laughs> and you're sitting there thinking you're a horrible student because your professor is so brilliant and you can't understand them. Exactly. I mean, it's it's just, it's fine. You know, you're there to learn. You're there to just take part in the experience. And making mistakes is part of the experience. I think it's also important to remember that most professors aren't super mean. If they see it going poorly, they will oftentimes just let you go because it's not a productive use of their class time to make an example out of you, per se, because they're trying to solicit an answer to to use as a teaching moment. 
So ideally, ideally, if it's well done. <laughs> and so if it's going poorly, oftentimes they'll just release you from your suffering and come back to you another time. I think that's true if they can tell that you're actually trying mm-hmm. and if they think that, OK, this person did the reading, they've clearly like prepared, but there's just something they're not getting. Right. I think in that case, most of them will just be like, you know what, we'll try again some other time. Where I think a lot of them are not so nice is if they think you're unprepared. Yeah, I remember one time I had no idea what the answer was to one question. And so I just started restating the facts of the case for some reason. I have no idea what question I was answering. (laughs) I just started talking about the case. And finally, my professor was like, "Um, thank you very much for that recitation of the facts. But I think we're going to move on. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> so clear that like I had no idea what I was supposed to be talking about. <laughs> he was just pivot, go somewhere else. <laughs> yeah, like let's just set, let's just hit the reset button. On yeah, this. exactly. Try again with someone else. Exactly. Try again. <laughs> I hope everyone wrote down the facts the second time around. <laughs> yeah. So I mean, I think the key is if you clearly are able to participate, you're going to end up being treated better. Typically than someone who just clearly is absolutely unprepared. So, I mean, what do you do if for some reason you didn't do the reading and it's your turn to be on call? Oh, well, um, different professors have different, I guess, rules or ways that they handle this. Um, Some profs will even put it in their syllabus that you can email them or tell them ahead of time if you didn't do the reading or if you're sick or if you're unprepared for class for some reason, and then they will not call on you. Um, some profs, I think that's a, that is a, uh, an option that should be used sparingly, but yes. it's a good option to have. Especially like, you know, if you have the flu or if you've right. had the flu and you're not prepared for class, I think a professor would much rather get an email from you being like, I'm behind, I had the flu, um, but I'm better. So I'm, I'm showing up to class today than, you know, call on you and have this person who's a mess that they don't know what's happening to, you know. Yeah, who's um, still like sniffling and sneezing mm-hmm. and... Yeah. Yeah. Some profs, again, to be used sparingly, will let you pass if you do get called on. But boy, again, use it sparingly because they're usually going to come back to you in the near future and you better be on top of it after that. Yeah, I think you should be pretty paranoid for the next few days Mm -hmm. and make sure that you're extremely well prepared if you pass. Yeah. I mean, you can also just try and struggle through until the prof realizes that you didn't do the reading. But I think this can almost be messier because some professors will get really frustrated by this and really mad, actually. Well, it is a waste of everyone's time. Mm-hmm. And it's not really like you're going to get away with it. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, if you if you don't even know like who the parties are and they're trying to talk to you about some detail of, you know, adverse possession or something and you've never heard these terms, it's not going to go well. I mean, sometimes students think like, oh, I can just kind of fake it and like read the case while they're asking me questions. That mm-hmm. doesn't work. Yeah. So what about making class more bearable? So if we can convince you not to be scared of class discussions, <laughs> we can also talk about things that can make class a little bit um, easier to stomach and, oh my gosh, what even somewhat enjoyable, possibly? Possibly. I mean, it depends on the professor, probably. Some yeah. of them, frankly, you're probably not going to enjoy, but <laughs> do what you can. Uh, I think actually one of the things that can help is if you, as you're reading the cases, really think about the questions that you would be asking and the sort of questions that you have about these cases and that you would want to get answers to. Mm -hmm. So then when you're in class, you can really be listening out for your own questions. And, you know, you might even write these down if you brief the cases or, you know, if you don't, whatever, Mm -hmm. just write, you know, scribble some notes about like, these are the things I'm still curious about that I wondered about. And then you'll be paying attention because you're going to be wondering if your professor is going to answer those. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's a really... A really good idea. Um, I also think it can be good to volunteer. I mean, you definitely don't want to be the hand <laughs> like you were just talking about. Right. But, but probably better to be that person than the one who never says anything. Mm-hmm. And I mean, what, that person is like slightly annoying, but at least you're going to make an impression. And sometimes, let's say you did some of the reading, but not all of the reading, or you have a feel very confident about some of the reading and not the rest of the reading, and you think you are right for the picking from your professor to get called on. Some professors, if you volunteer, that will basically defer your cold call for a while. And so you can almost strategically manage the situation so you can prevent being put on the spot when you're not prepared. It doesn't work for all professors, but if you pay attention in class, you can see the method of their madness somewhat, and it it can work. 
Yeah, absolutely. I mean, if there are like, you know, certain, say you never do your reading on Friday. I don't know why you always go out to bar review on Thursday and never do it. You know, and you know, you don't want to get cold called on Friday, like volunteer on Monday or Wednesday, you'll probably not get called on Friday. Exactly. Yeah. I also think it's very important that students remember what to focus on, because I think one of the things that can be very confusing and frustrating about class is you're trying to pay attention to everything everybody's saying. So you're trying right, to pay- and you have and you have no context. In right. The beginning. No, context. everything. Everything sounds brilliant. Like every word out of somebody else's mouth sounds important. <laughs> exactly. So it's like, OK, am I you supposed to be writing down what the student says, what the prof says, all the questions they're asking? Um, I think we've talked about on the podcast and definitely on the blog about not taking transcription notes or notes oh, yeah. that are basically just everything what? that ever is being said by everybody yeah. in class. You're, you're not a court reporter. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> you're not a court reporter. So you know, what are you supposed to be focusing on? And I think that a good rule of thumb is listening carefully, removing your fingers from the typewriter, don't write everything down, or the typewriter, where'd that come from? <laughs> How about <laughs> remove your fingers from the computer? <laughs> wow, Lee. I know. I mean, I really... Or, it's been or a while as we you... often encourage students, yes. we really think taking notes by hand can be a good option. Yes, so you don't even have to have a typewriter or a computer. I don't know. I got up really early this morning. I don't know <laughs> where that came from. And apparently went back in time. Apparently went back in time. Um, so one of the things that you will see when you start listening is that good professors will typically give you some clues about what you should be writing down and what is important, even if it's something that the student said. Um, so, Right, because remember, the goal here is the professor asks a question. Mm-hmm. It's not like really a question question. They're basically trying to get the student to answer with the information they're looking for. Right. So, you know, it might be like, oh, you know, could you give us the facts of the case? That one's easy. That's a softball. You should be able to do that. <laughs> right. But then it might get more complicated. Well, what was the argument that the plaintiff made about whether there was, you know, element X? Mm -hmm. And part of that is they want the argument, but they're also kind of expecting you to tell them what the law is. Right. Exactly. And sometimes professors will even go a step further and repeat important things that students say. So let's say I asked Allison a question. I'm the professor. I asked Allison a question and then she gives me an answer. And then I turn to the class and I say... Did everyone hear what Ms. Monahan just said there? That's like, ding, ding, ding. That's ding, ding, ding. Like, get up, you know, pick up your pen, like, put your fingers on the keyboard. You know, the court stated that you needed to use the totality of the circumstances test to determine the outcome. And then all of that, you should write all of that down. All of that, that should is, be written that down. That is the black letter law. That is the black letter law. And then maybe you kick it, they will kick it back to the students. Now, Ms. Monahan, what were some of the things that the court looked at as part of their totality of the circumstances analysis? And then whatever the student says after that, the professor agrees with, you should write down. Right. And the student might be wrong. They might give them eight things and only six of them are really accurate. So it's fine to write all eight of them. Just make sure you mark out the two that your professor's like, well, I'm not really sure that's exactly on point. Mm -hmm. So that is the key that your professor is giving you quality stuff. You know, what are the facts? What are this? Or or my personal favorite, well, student so-and-so, what did you think of What do you case? think about that? <laughs> like, don't like, write that down. That's the classic, like, professor is not prepared to teach this class <laughs> question. <laughs> they are killing time at that point because they do not know what else to say. Yeah. yeah. Because no one cares what you think about this case. No. No. I mean, maybe in, like, some very broad pedagogical way. But basically... Do not bother writing down what the other student says. No, exactly. I, but if the professor says, well, I think that's a really good point. I agree that blah, 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 that you want to write down. Exactly, exactly. Another area that I think can get very confusing for students, and you mentioned this earlier, Allison, was when a professor starts giving out hypos and changing facts. You know, so what if the light was yellow instead of green? What if the light was red? What if there was a statute that said X, Y, and Z? And oftentimes professors will do this to show you how facts can become more and more ambiguous. But oftentimes what happens after the string of hypos is whoever's the hand in that class will shoot the hand up and start creating even crazier hypos. Yes. Um, that could be totally off off point. And well, what this, if instead of driving a car, they were they were piloting a boat, right? Or it's driving like, a buggy, who cares? or <laughs> it can be all sorts of. What if it was a stuff. spaceship? Yes. And you're like, why are we talking about spaceships? Right. Like we're we're talking about a car crash. Yeah. 
You know, so, but what is very frustrating, I think, for a lot of 1L students is they're trying to first write down whatever crazy hypo that the student came up with. And then you're trying to also follow the professor's explanation of this. Again, unless the professor uses some key words to draw the class back in, like, that's a very interesting point, so-and-so. Did everybody hear that? Like, let's review that. You know, something to basically say, hey, everybody, let's come back and pay attention because I'm teaching again. I think it's just fine to listen to whatever is going on in the class discussion with this off the ball hypo, but it's probably not going to be something you're responsible for. So don't drive yourself crazy over it. I think it can make class very, very confusing. And it's shocking how easy it is to create these factual scenarios that make no sense when you're new to the law, because you just can see twists and turns at every, at every moment. Yeah, and a lot of times the professor is sort of in an effort to be encouraging or in an effort to kill some time. They'll actually entertain this stuff for a while. And you can just go back and forth down these like quarters of insanity where everyone's sitting there thinking like, what does this have to do with anything? Mm -hmm. And oftentimes the question, the answer is like, not really that much. You Mm -hmm. know, this class is spiraling off the rails. (laughs) Or sometimes you'll have people who were paralegals before, um, law school. Who worked on the Hill. Yeah. So you might be in a class where people have even real things that they've seen, but you're listening to them going, how is this relevant to what is happening in CRIM right now? I don't have no idea. And the answer is it's not. Yeah, or like I saw something on that. I always love this in CRIM. Somebody would come in and like, I saw on TV last night this thing. And it's just like, we're talking about like the degrees of murder. <laughs> right. What is like this evidentiary issue on some like criminal law show have to do with anything? And yeah. the professor's like, oh, I could talk to you about that for a while. And you're like, should I be writing this down? Like, right. this be on the test? Like, does this have anything to do with anything? It's like, we all watched The Good Wife last night, but I'm not really sure. <laughs> you know what? Yeah, exactly. <gasps> so there's always something where everybody wants to talk about it. Mm-hmm. Um, and depending on the professor, they may or may not entertain this sort of thing for very long. But, you know, a lot of them are like, they find the law interesting. They're happy to chat about it for a while. But the problem is when they go off on these tangents, you know, you're sort of missing the reason that you're there, which is presumably they have something they actually want to cover that day. Right. And I think current events or something else that can also um, come up in class, they can send the class off into a tangent. Again, you have to be very careful about getting too caught up in that from a notes and a, and a focus perspective. Because what you don't want to do is come back to your class notes and say, wow, all we talked about was, you know, flooding in Louisiana and yeah, or like Donald Trump trying to like sue someone on some First Amendment thing and you're in like Civ Pro. You know? <laughs> right, it's just like, you know? it's like, like why all... do I have half a page of notes on this? Is that going to be on my final? <laughs> it's, it's just probably not. probably not. Yeah, and I think one thing people can think about is different note taking techniques. I mean, I'll, most people will be taking notes on a laptop unless your professor doesn't allow them. Having done it myself, I think actually you're probably better off not having your laptop in class with you. It's a huge distraction and also encourages this kind of like court reporter behavior where you're just trying to type, 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 and you're not really focusing. I think having handwritten notes is probably actually the better option. There's a lot of studies on this. Obviously, you can't write as much, which means you have to write more judiciously, which is good. And it could also depend on the professor and how they teach. I mean, some of them almost just give you like a running Like, you know, class starts an hour and a half later, you know, we've covered like 18 million different things. In that case, like maybe you need a laptop to get all that down. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it's important to try out different things, but realize that more isn't always better. And I would also make a note for students who have um, some sort of accommodations with the school, possibly for a learning disability um, or a variety of other disabilities that may come up during law school that oftentimes the school will even provide you with note takers or things like that. So one of the things you want to check with your school as soon as you can is if you do get those accommodations, what are those accommodations and how can you uh, make sure you have access to what you need? Because that could really change your classroom experience um, for the better. Yeah. And I think sometimes people ask if they can tape the class either visually or just the talking and listen to it later. I mean, a lot of professors allow that. I think a lot of them sort of have to allow it. I'm not sure it's a great idea for most people just because it can be an enormous waste of time to listen to these classes again. Mm -hmm. But if you're really not getting it, that might be an option. Or again, like 
getting the note taking so that you can actually pay attention and listen in class and know that if you miss something, you know, the name of a case or something that got thrown out, that someone else is going to have recorded that and you're going to have the option to get those notes later. Mm -hmm. Something else that we haven't talked about at all, too, which I think is worth mentioning is be thoughtful about where you choose to sit in your classes. Oh, yes. Uh, Some people who really are easily distracted may want to sit towards the front of the class so they can't see, you know, Heads, playing solitaire, laptops, you know, all sorts of varieties of activities happening in class. Um, some of the stuff people did in class was crazy. Yeah, it was. I a mean, sometimes crazy. you just look up and be like, "Are you seriously watching that right now?" <laughs> <laughs> like you're in law school. <laughs> yeah, it's also important to remember that most everyone can see your laptop screen. So think about yeah, that you're, when you're. Yeah, uh, when exactly. You're doing everyone knows stuff. what you're doing. Exactly. But um, it is. Th- it is something to think about. And maybe even your first semester, you say, oh, I want to sit in the back um, because I don't want to you know, have my face right in front of the professor. But then you realize that it's harder to pay attention back there. So you want to sit up to the front. Um, try different things, but it can actually change your uh, experience based on where you sit in the room. Oh, absolutely. And I think everybody kind of has their natural favorite and it might be your favorite, but then you also have the one that you think is probably the best for you. Mm-hmm. So you yeah. can choose. You can choose accordingly. Yes, <laughs> we all have our favorites of things that maybe aren't our our best solutions. I think we have a podcast coming up on on that about self sabotaging behavior and <laughs> yeah, maybe where to sit in class is one of those examples. Maybe <laughs> I know that I should sit in the middle and look like I'm paying attention, but I always like to sit in the back on the aisle so I can come in late. <laughs> Exactly. I'm like, I guarantee your professor notices that you're always coming in late. Yeah. They're marking one of those cryptic marks is always late, <laughs> always deduct late. points. Exactly. And yeah. speaking of being late is one of those things that certain professors get really upset about. Super upset. Once they close those doors, they do not want to hear them open again. Yeah. And some of them literally like lock the door and forbid you from coming in. Mm-hmm. So if you're someone who, you know, naturally procrastinates, you want to make sure that you're there aiming to be there a few minutes early so that you can actually get in and listen because most professors will take points off. I mean, I think there are even ABA requirements about how many classes you can miss. So mm-hmm. you don't want to be that person who's like in danger of not getting credit for the class because you don't show up to it. And again, you know, you're paying a lot of money to be there. So yeah, do just the math. Go. It's like hundreds of dollars a class. I know. Just go and listen. You might learn something. And you never know. It, you never know. And it does make studying a lot easier if you've actually paid attention in class. Yeah, and if you've taken good notes. I mean, yeah. that's the thing. Like within a few weeks, you want to be looking back at your notes from the first week and think like, would this help me when I'm studying? If not, it's time to switch up what you're doing. Yeah. And you should probably go to class. I guess even besides being late, there is, are some people who say that class is not worth going to. I do think not going to class is a mistake. I would say generally people feel that way yeah. in the end. Yep. I mean, I did, have a, I did have a friend third year, but this is third year, who literally lived in a different city and came like once a month. But, you know, it was his third year. It was his last semester. He knew how to take a law school exam. He had carefully selected his classes so that he had good outlines. He had friends in the classes. And he knew the professor didn't take attendance. Yeah. Can't say I recommend it, but he got away with it. <laughs> right. Probably not a good thing to try your first semester of law school. <laughs> yeah, totally different scenario. <laughs> yeah. Well, with that, we are out of time. If you enjoyed this episode of the Law School Toolbox podcast, please take a second to leave a review and rating on iTunes. We'd really appreciate it. And be sure to subscribe so you don't miss anything. New episodes are typically released on Mondays. If you have any questions or comments, please don't hesitate to reach out to myself or Allison at lee at lawschooltoolbox.com or allison at lawschooltoolbox.com. Or you can always contact us via our website contact form at lawschooltoolbox.com. Thanks for listening and we'll talk soon.